Part, the Ethiopian government says it's taking on the TPLF to protect its citizens. My next guest tweeting, dispensing constitutional responsibilities to avert the threat of terrorist and insurgent groups that have chosen to take up arms over partaking in democratic processes remains key. And the Prime Minister's press secretary, Bileni Seum, joining us now live from Addis Ababa. It has been a year, and thank you for joining us, a year since the start of Ethiopia's conflict, yet we are seeing armed groups fighting your government increasing as numbers as they advance towards the capital. What's happening on the ground and how far are the TPLF and other allies from Addis Ababa? Becky, thank you so much for having me. Um, before I answer your question, it would be quite disingenuous of me to respond to, to your question without first addressing the big elephant in the room. And it's important for me to share with you as well as your global audience that um, Ethiopians, a majority of Ethiopians um, in Ethiopia as well as abroad, strongly feel that CNN has covered the conflict over the past year in a manner that is highly biased and detached from context. And a recent example is the hysteria that CNN had caused last week as if Addis Ababa was under siege sending a global message that the city is about to go down. And we have often shared that it seems Ethiopia is undergoing what seems like a coordinated media campaign to tarnish the image of the country, to tarnish the image of the prime minister and his administration, and media outlets like CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, and Reuters in particular, as well as others, have often chosen to carry an overly negative and skewed narrative missing important nuances. And I reiterate this to you because I also heard the opening right. lines, which takes away or is devoid of um, assigning uh, the actual blame where it is, um, assigning the blame to the TPLF that initiated this conflict. And they have also given testimony and uh, confessed that they're the ones that attacked the northern command of the National Diverse Defense Forces. Right. So I think let, it's important... Let, let, me just, that let me respond to your, to your words, because I've given you a chance um, to say your bit. Um, our work... Thank you. Um, our reporting was conducted carefully and methodically by CNN's highly experienced team in the region and elsewhere. We stand by its findings as well as the language used in our reporting, which we believe is fully justified. Here's a question to you. There are a number of media organizations, including CNN, currently in Ethiopia, who are not being allowed to report, not being granted accreditation from the government. What is the reason for that and why? Why, if you want the story told, are you not allowing those organizations, including CNN, to try to do their work? That is a disinformation that is being perpetrated, Becky, and I dare say this because I also deal directly with some of the oh, media. Oh, hold on. Hold on. You wanted to have a... You, 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 what is disinformation? We have a, we have a team... I trying to get to yes. work on the ground. I, Hang on, yes, yes. but don't yes. accuse us of, of, of disinformation. Are you, are you suggesting that we don't have a team that's trying to report on the ground with respect? Your team is on the ground, but your team did not come into the country or some members of your team did not come into the country by following the due process. I was informed or some members of the government were informed of CNN being on the ground and asking for accreditation. The accreditation process Are you prepared to have your... them work on the ground and get accredited so that they finish. can tell the story? You would have to allow me to finish. This is not a hostile environment to okay. the media at all. There are so many other media entities that have entered the country. There are other media entities that had requested and been facilitated entry into the country, into the region that they wanted to cover these stories at. However, this, for the amount of uh, blame that the Ethiopian government is um, you know, admonished for not allowing media, you never hear about the media that actually do enter a report, and you don't hear about the media entities that have been grant granted accreditation, but their own uh, headquarters tell them not to actually enter to the country. So these are also, you know, stories that need to be at the forefront. Okay, let's, let's, let's try and get to the bottom of what is going on here, because everybody wants the best for Ethiopia. I know you will agree with that. Certainly, we are just trying to get our work done and get to the bottom of what's going on. So let's do this. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has called for unrestricted access to Degre, to Amhara and Afar, saying that no convoys with supplies had entered Tigray since October the 18th. I have heard this 
from numerous agency sources. What will it take for the Ethiopian government to facilitate access and end, end what the UN has called a man-made crisis? Let's start with that and then we'll get into the politics. Sure, um, Becky, you know, humanitarian concerns are equally as important for the Ethiopian government. So the portrayal of the government as a demagogue with no interest in the well-being of its own people throughout the country is erroneous, and it's not right. That is why it invested up to 100 billion bur in humanitarian assistance and infrastructure repair works in the Tigray region. Until the National Defense Forces had withdrawn out of the Tigray region, which is the end of June 2021, the Ethiopian government um, had allocated or was covering up to 70% of humanitarian assistance. After the exit of the National Defense Forces, the onus of responsibility on humanitarian access reaching the intended beneficiaries within the Tigray region is on the TPLF. There has been what we have witnessed after the humanitarian ceasefire that was enacted by the government is encroachment by the TPLF into the Tigray and Amhara. Uh, with, and, with, uh, respe with respect, that is, not, that, is not, that is not the evidence of what our teams have seen on the ground, nor the evidence that I am being given by agencies who are still on the ground. They are... <laughs> The access isn't available, and that access isn't available. It may be from, 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 from the TPF side as well, but the Ethiopian government is not, is not helping. Why? The access, Why? The access is been there, they may have been bureaucratic, cumbersome processes. And in fact, at the beginning, the complaint from the from international humanitarian assistance partners was that there were so many checkpoints. So the checkpoints, in my understanding, at the beginning, which were seven, have been decreased, heeding to the complaints that were being lodged by humanitarian actors. And the reason for the Ethiopian government putting these humanitarian checkpoints in place is also for the safety of its people within the Afar and Hamara region that are on the borders of where TPLF had been, been active and also is trying to encroach upon, which they eventually did. Now, I think it's also important that for many months now, we have been facilitating every effort, including those by the UN, to get the food and aid to those in need. However, the TPLF has also been lying about this and politicizing and weaponizing humanitarian there assistance. We've seen reports as well from the USAID saying that some of their humanitarian assistance was being diverted to fighters instead of those beneficiaries. We have over 800 right, okay. trucks that have accounted for that have entered the region. Why are we uh, not asking those questions as well? We have seen these well, trucks uh, carry... And I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the opportunity... Hang on. Hang on. I'm giving you the opportunity to put your side here. I'm also just making the point that I'm not... This isn't coming from the TPLF. I'm, I'm talking about the fact that humanitarian aid is being prevented from getting in. I'm being told this by humanitarian agencies. The WFP has had tanker after tanker after tanker held up, which has got fuel, essential fuel, to get to the people in need. Look, let's do the politics here, because the politics lie behind what is going on here. Prime Minister Abbey yeah. has called on Ethiopians to be... Hold on, please. Prime Minister Abbey has called on Ethiopians to be ready to defend the capital. You know that to be true. What does this mean? And is an armed solution the right solution at this point? OK, so the Prime Minister calling upon the Ethiopian people to defend their city, to defend their communities, to defend their country, is supplanting or supporting the government's responsibility and constitutionally mandated responsibility to thwart off any attacks, any terrorist attacks. As you know, the TPLF and their, their partners have been deemed or designated by the House of People's Representatives in a constitutionally, in an Ethiopian constitutionally clear process, designated as terrorist organizations. So you are seeing the rhetoric coming from the other side, saying we are going to take over Addis Ababa, there's going to be a siege under uh, um, of uh, the, the capital. With all this narrative building up, it's important for everybody to be aware and to be alert. So this is not okay. necessarily a from the prime minister to arm everybody and, um, uh, you know, descend into civil chaos. But this is about being vigilant in their communities that this kind of threat, which is being okay. overtly declared by the TPLF, is upon us. The prime, the, the prime minister also said, and I quote him here, we will bury this enemy with our blood and bones and make the glory of Ethiopia high again, calling on citizens to take up arms and, quote, bury the terrorist TPLF. This is very heavy rhetoric from a leader. 
And it doesn't sound from that as if there is any room for the Ethiopian government to talk to the TPLF. Look, Facebook removed the Prime Minister's post. How can Ethiopia unite under this current Prime Minister when he continues to use language inciting violence against particular Becky, that, ethnic groups? That is the perspective and the perspective of CNN. Um, the Ethiopian government ran the first... I've Democratic just quoted what the Prime Minister said in a Facebook post that was then removed by Facebook for inciting need, violence. You need to let me explain. You need to, ex uh, you need to let me explain. Okay. We are contesting the removal of this post by Facebook because we do not feel that it is as alarmist as Facebook has. Um, now, there's other context for these global corporations and global entities. What, working part of this, what part of that post do you not see as alarmist? Do you not see I, as... Can I finish? Insights. I, I'm hard asking to... you, I, I'm, I am literally asking you a very simple question there. The nuances of the Amharic language. The Prime Minister is not asking people to go and attack their counterparts and their brothers and sisters. There has been a clear pathway from the Prime Minister from the beginning that he came to the administration, asking for peace, asking for unity throughout the country. There have been several, several attempts by the TPLF and the war drums that have been beating up before the November 2020 altercation. Through all of that, the federal government, championed and spearheaded by the prime minister, has been very clear that the, we did not want this to descend into where it is right now. So calling upon the Ethiopian people to defend themselves, calling upon the Ethiopian people to protect themselves should not be seen in that negative light. Some nuances within the Amharic language maybe or easily, if you're splitting hair, can be taken to mean other things. But there is no clear call for violence on each other. What, what the prime minister and the government, the federal government of Ethiopia are asking is for all to be vigilant that the threat of TPLF is there because they are saying they want to take over, they want to attempt a coup, and they want to topple a government, a legitimately elected government, Bil if I may say. Right. Bellini, I think, I, th I think, you know, what was written in that post was unequivocal. Look, he, he, Prime Minister Abiy described war, and I quote him here, as the epitome of hell during his acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize. Now he is presiding over a protracted civil war, effectively. And, and by the way, how concerned are you that this is going to get worse and this will ultimately become a civil war? Perhaps, that, perhaps we're not there yet. But it looks no, as if not... we could be. What will it take to stop this? That is not true. So again, facts and the way that the narrative is being shaped by your media as well is important because that's not the case. The prime minister. So, so how would you describe it? Constitution to thwart of any attacks on the state, on the integrity of the state as well. The constitution, if you're willing to go through it, declares that and puts that mm -hmm. as a responsibility mandated on the prime minister. The TPLF is an organ that has been designated by our House of People's Representatives as a terrorist organization. If the mm -hmm. TPLF, if you remember in end of June 2020, 2021, when there was a unilateral humanitarian ceasefire that was enacted, the opportunity for peace was there. The opportunity, this unilateral ceasefire that was taken by the government was paying heed to the suffering of our own people. And we, we need to also acknowledge that the people of Tigray are our own people as well. So heeding to the pains mm -hmm. that they are undergoing because of the criminal tendencies and the power grab that is uh, being pushed by a small criminal enterprise and a small clique, acknowledging that the unilateral right. humanitarian ceasefire was considered a joke by the PLF. And what you saw them is encroaching into two other regions, looting properties, destructing properties, killing civilians, you know, raping women and children as well. So this needs well, to I, be thwarted. I, he has a responsibility I, I, to... I, I, I'm giving you the, I'm, I, I am giving you the opportunity to, to put your side uh, to us uh, today and, and, and to our viewers, of course. Um, and it's been a long time that we've been hoping to have this conversation. And so I, I, I'm glad that, that, that you are, that you've been prepared to, to, to come on the show today and, and have this discussion. As you rightly point out, Tigrayans are Ethiopians. So since the state of emergency has been imposed, witnesses tell CNN that Tigrayans are being ethnically targeted and arrested by authorities. Ethiopia's state-appointed Human Rights Commission says the arrests are happening on reasonable grounds as the detainees are suspected of collaborating with terrorist groups. Is there any proof of that? 
I mean, we have, this is a state of emergency was something that was enacted last week. So I would need to get further details in terms of the way that it is being implemented. But the enactment of the state of emergency is not to target any particular person based on the identity that they're aligned to. The state of emergency is put in place to protect the Ethiopian people, to protect the residents of Addis Ababa who have been told with very, very fierce rhetoric coming from the TPLF that we are going to siege or we're going to come into Addis Ababa. So it's important for the state of emergency to put in place a mechanism uh, that anybody that is trying to threaten the stability or the peace that is within the capital city is um, is thoroughly addressed as well. So the details that you're asking for, right. this is something that's been in the pipeline. I may come back to you at okay. another point. In well, well, the government has declared a state of emergency. Uh, reflecting the rapid escalation uh, of this conflict that ultimately you know, threatens to tear apart Ethiopia and further destabilize the Horn of Africa. Your government has urged foreign powers to stand with Ethiopia's democracy. You do not have the support of Washington, for example, which just this week accused Ethiopia of gross human rights breaches and said that it planned to remove the country from an important trade pact. What's the government's message to Washington. Who are you speaking to here? And, and, and just, just describe how you feel about the response from the international community at this point. I mean, Becky, let me just backtrack a little bit and address something that you had said. This is not the first time that a state of emergency has been enacted within the country, so we shouldn't use this particular point to um, exaggerate things more than that they are and to create an alarmist environment, because that's what a lot of international media have created. Going to your second question, the engagement with the U.S. is uh, still constructive. We, we look for a very constructive engagement. Uh, the U.S., the United States, has been a strong ally of Ethiopia for a very long time, and Ethiopia has also been a bastion of stability within and, and, the region. And they have described Ethiopia as an important partner, but that partner is not a constructive partner anymore. I spoke to Samantha Power about this just yesterday. Just yesterday. You lose the support um, of Washington. You lose the incredibly important trade pact that's there. Officials are sanctioned. What sort of impact will that have on Ethiopia's economy with respect and the people of Ethiopia. And isn't it time to push for a ceasefire and to sort this thing out? Your response. Thank you. The humanitarian ceasefire was already in place. Remember, the TPLF brandished it as a joke. So I'm not entirely sure what you're talking about further other than that. With regards to the U.S., there is constructive engagement that we're looking for. And it, this constructive engagement needs to be rooted in the context and understanding of the complexity of what's unfolding. The same with the international community. Um, we need the U.S. and the international um, community support to defend democracy, justice, and the people of Ethiopia. And I say to defend democracy because for the first time in Ethiopia's modern history, we underwent the first democratic elections. It might not be perfect in the eyes of the U.S. and might not be perfect in the eyes of the international community, mm. but it's the best mm. that Ethiopia has come across. And these are building blocks for the democratization process that we have embarked upon in 2018. Are they painful? They are right. painful. Are they, um, you know, is it, is it facilitating a segue for something uh, more solid and foundational to come? Yes, but we still need that because this is a democratically and legitimately elected government and the, the prime minister the Ethiopian government faces huge criticism at present and 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 there are there are calls from pretty much everywhere at this point for a ceasefire so you're right to point out that there was the bones of a humanitarian ceasefire at one point but there are calls now for a full ceasefire briefly tell me what do you expect will happen next at this point you know, this is something that Ethiopia has been preparing for in terms of uh, facilitating a peaceful conclusion to this, uh, you know, uh, really uh, troublesome chapter. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia remains committed to enabling an all-inclusive national dialogue that is aimed at addressing all political contestations. And the institutions and processes that are being laid out for that national dialogue to take place, and such details will um, emerge accordingly. But we believe that this process needs to be Ethiopian in form and the nature, uh, in this nature, will produce mm -hmm. positive results gaining uh, uh, stability mm -hmm. and peace. This all-inclusive uh, uh, national dialogue is something Wait. in the pipeline.
With that, we will leave it there. Um, we have been pushing to speak to the Prime Minister. I have wanted to get the Ethiopian government's perspective now for some time. I do appreciate your time uh, today. Um, it's important that we have this discussion. I would like to speak to the Prime Minister. So that invitation uh, is there. If you would like to, please uh, take that to him. Um, I think it would be important for the international community, the rest of the world, the viewers uh, who will be watching this show uh, today and at this time every day, uh, they would like to hear from Prime Minister um, Ali you. Ahmed Abby. as well. So we thank you very much indeed for joining us. And in the next hour, I will talk to Gedachu Reda. He is the spokesman for the Tigray People's Liberation Front. That is coming up on Connect the World next hour. And let's, lest we forget, let's just remember that this has been a year, a year, this conflict. And tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in Ethiopia's lives are at stake as a result of what is going on.